Hello, and welcome to the Nursing World Shared Practice Forum. My name is Patricia Hickey, and I am the Vice President and Associate Chief Nurse of Cardiovascular and Critical Care Services at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, we would like to welcome Patricia Lincoln. Trish is a clinical nurse specialist in the cardiac ICU at Boston Children's. Today's discussion will be about an innovative sedation and pain management program that Trish has led with the nurses in the cardiac ICU. This initiative is called Cardiac Restore. Welcome, Trish. What exactly is Cardiac Restore? Thank you, Patty. Cardiac Restore is a nurse-implemented, goal-directed plan to manage patient pain and sedation. Restore is an acronym for randomized evaluation of sedation for respiratory failure. What do you hope to accomplish with Cardiac Restore? We want to improve the quality of patient care related to sedation management in the cardiac intensive care unit. What we hope to see is that the patients that are managed with Cardiac Restore experience less sedative exposure without clinically significant pain, agitation, or withdrawal symptoms than the patients receiving usual care. So for context, what is the background for Cardiac Restore? The development of Cardiac Restore involved work from two other studies. One was Martha Curley's original Restore work, protocolized sedation versus usual care in pediatric patients mechanically ventilated for acute respiratory failure. This was a randomized control trial which took place in PICUs in the United States. The primary outcome of this study was duration of mechanical ventilation. However, the patients in the study that were treated with Restore had fewer days when they received opioid medications, they were exposed to fewer sedatives, and they were more often quiet and calm while intubated. The other study involved in the development of Cardiac Restore involved surveying cardiac ICU nurses in three tertiary academic pediatric heart centers in the United States. And the results of this study described nurse decision-making and patient responses associated with the administration of pain and sedation medication. Conclusions from the study um, and from the nurses that were surveyed um, said that they used many nonspecific indicators to describe patients' level of comfort, including agitation, patient pain, um, how safe the patient was in relation to the monitoring equipment, and also patient hemodynamics. There were many decisions for managing patient care um, and patient comfort that were influenced by the, how stable the patient was hemodynamically. Incredible work. Why is a plan needed, do you think, to manage patient pain and sedation in the cardiac ICU? There's evolving evidence and concerns that the sedatives that we use um, are neurotoxic. Also, many patients in the cardiac ICU have undergone multiple surgeries, they've experienced long ICU days, and they may have had episodes of hypoxia. And all of these situations and conditions have effects on the developing brain. If there's any way for us to be able to better manage some of these factors, and in which case limiting the amount of exposure of certain pain and sedation medications, we need to do that. Also, before using Cardiac Restore, we experienced wide variation in pain and sedation administration, prescribing these medications, and then weaning from these medications. There was also a lot of inconsistency on how iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms in these patients were being managed. The nurse caring for the patient and the patient and their family experienced a great deal of frustration with the inconsistencies of pain and sedation medication management. What would happen is that there was a different plan each day for pain and sedation management or a different plan for how we were going to wean the medications that the patient was receiving. And because the plan changed each day, there was never enough time for the effects of one plan um, to become apparent before that was changed to another plan. So tell me about the preparation and support that you needed to move this initiative forward. The use of Cardiac Restored was a huge change in practice. One of the first things we needed to do was to assure the support and collaboration of the department heads of cardiac surgery, and cardiac medicine. What was also important from the beginning is that we needed to have a physician champion to be involved. 
Um, and that physician champion needed to be present with myself at any meeting that we had with the department heads or anyone else um, going from the start. So together, myself and the physician champion presented the restore, uh, the cardiac restore plan. Um, we fielded questions, concerns. We made some revisions when there needed to be revisions made. With some of the groups, we were able to just meet once um, and um, all come to consensus on it. But with other groups, we had to meet a number of times um, and make a, and with reassurance, making changes, um, follow up. Um, but we were able to come to consensus. It was also very important that from the beginning to involve respiratory therapy and pharmacy because we were um, these were ventilated patients, and um, we were d dealing with many different types of pain and sedation medications. Overall, it was important that this be a multidisciplinary effort for this practice change to be successful. What we didn't change were the pain and sedation medications that we were going to use on the patients. The primary uh, agents that we use are morphine and midazolam. We use them as, as needed, and then we also use them as continuous infusions. We will use fentanyl in newborns or for some of our very young patients instead of morphine, um, the patient population experiencing hypotension or if there's reactive airway disease present. In many patients, uh, we start round the clock non-opioid analgesics. Um, these are alternating doses of acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We begin those medications when it's appropriate. For example, if it's a patient that um, we know we're going to be managing pain and sedation and be intubated for a couple of days, we may start the, um, the non-opioid pain medications very soon after they come back from the OR. In those patients that whose chests are open, that we know that we're going to be dealing with pain and sedation medications over an extended period of time, weeks, we may wait until a more appropriate time to start the round-the-clock non-opioid pain medications. We also have to look at the specific uh, patient themselves to make sure that these medications are not contraindicated. For example, a patient having elevated liver function tests wouldn't be started on acetaminophen. Um, the patient with a decreased platelet count, we wouldn't start non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We'll use propofol to facilitate extubation in many patients. Uh, Dexmedetomidate may be added in if the patient is unresponsive to some of the primary agents or to start to decrease the amount of midazolam that we're using. Current studies are showing that um, the earlier that uh, dexmedetomidate is started, the more effective it is um, in, in conjunction with the other agents. So not to wait um, out a few weeks to start um, dexmedetomidate. To manage the iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms, um, we start clonidine. Um, we may transition the patient that's receiving midazolam over to scheduled lorazepam and alternate those with clonidine to get better coverage to manage um, any iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms if the patient is experiencing those. Once we have the clonidine doses optimized and we are in a comfortable <coughs> alternating doses of uh, clonidine and any other of the benzodiazepines, and the patient is still experiencing uh, iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms, then we may consider starting methadone. Um, we're watch scoring the patients um, before we start the wean and then continually through the wean um, to see if those Watt scores are elevated. And that's how we're evaluating the patient for presence of iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms. We'd like to turn to our colleagues around the world and ask a question. When you state your answer, could you please include your city and country location? The question is, if a patient exhibits iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms, what medications are used to manage this? What was the length of time needed to put all of this together? It took almost two years to get all the supports in place. Um, we needed to make revisions in the plan so that everyone was comfortable. And then we also needed to identify um, and educate the staff that was going to be um, help with training. We did about a month of intensive training with staff. Um, we felt that as soon as we started training staff that they would be so excited about um, 
how we were going to approach pain and sedation management that they would want to start using um, Restore with uh, inpatient care. And we didn't want to layer on another plan for pain and sedation and, and add into the inconsistency that was already in there. So we wanted to move right from training into using Cardiac Restore. There was a core group of nurses that did the training with the RN staff, and we have about 160 nurses on staff in the cardiac ICU. This training was done using PowerPoint presentations and question and answer sessions. Each of the staff was assigned a computerized refresher course on the use of the pain scales and the state behavioral scale, and then also um, using WAT1 scoring um, for, to um, assess the patient for withdrawal symptoms. After receiving the cardiac restore training, uh, the RN staff then completed a computerized scenario-based learning module on the use of cardiac restore. Uh, there was about a 90% completion rate on all of these. Currently, we introduce Cardiac Restore in nursing orientation, and those new staff are um, then um, matched with preceptors at the bedside, which reinforce um, the teachings of Cardiac Restore in the clinical time in patient care. I also completed training with each of our nurse practitioners, and these nurse practitioners are part of our medical team in the cardiac ICU. Um, identified a champion from the nurse practitioner group to bring into the core cardiac restore group. And this was a really important piece because the nurse practitioners have both the nursing piece uh, of the cardiac restore, but they're also prescribers. So they're able to identify any concerns or uh, problems with prescribing cardiac restore and our order sets to be able to make it easier to institute cardiac restore with our patient population. The physician champion did all the original training with the cardiac medical fellows. And presently that physician champion, along with the nurse practitioner tra team, train the cardiac medical fellows as they rotate through the ICU. We have three teams of physicians that care for the patients in the ICU. We went live with Cardiac Restore on one team for about two weeks to make sure that that transition would go smoothly, and then we added in the other two teams. What type of data retrieval and analysis was needed? What we wanted to do is we wanted to monitor the change in the practice. We work with programmers to auto-extract information from the ele electronic medical record. The data we look at are the comfort measures, um, pain scales, the state behavioral scale, uh, what one scoring. We look at what they are. We look to see if they're elevated, and if they are elevated, how quickly that score is reduced. We measure medication exposure of the patient to benzodiazepines and opioids. We look at any use at all of these medications. Then we look at use on the day of transfer from the ICU, and we look at use of these medications on day prior to hospital discharge. We measure length of stay in the ICU, and we measure total hospital length of stay, and we do both of these in days. We measure hours of mechanical ventilation. We risk adjust all of this information using the STAT risk categories, age at surgery, and technical performance score, TPS. We also look at ho the hospital's safety event reporting files because we want to monitor for any adverse events related to our pain and sedation practices. We look at collapsy rates. We look at pressure ulcers, unplanned extubations, the need for reintubation, and any medication errors related to pain and sedation medications. We look at all of this information in three-month increments. Um, we exclude the two months when the training occurred and when Cardiac Restore first went live. For every three months we go forward with the cardiac restore information, we compare that extracted data to the same time interval before cardiac restore went live. At this point, we have six months of post-cardiac restore information, and we compare that with six months of pre-restore information. So what happens as a patient is followed on cardiac restore? So a patient is admitted to the cardiac ICU. Um, there's team discussion at that time of the patient's trajectory of illness, illness, or how sick is the patient. Based on the decision of what the patient's trajectory of illness is, that drives the goal SBS. 
and then the patient's pain and sedation medication administration and management is focused around that, maintaining the patient at that goal SBS. The goal pain score for any patient um, is usually less than four. So you don't want a patient to be uncomfortable and a pain score of greater than four would have um, be a patient that was experiencing discomfort. At any time and with any illness trajectory, if the patient is being followed um, for an evolving clinical state, um, we look for other reasons that may, be, may precipitate this. So inadequate ventilation, a patient in an uncomfortable uh, position, and in these cases, we use non-pharmacological interventions. So we look at those things first, we look at them quickly, and then we proceed into pain and sed uh, administration of pain and sedation methods. So if the patient is in the acute phase, this patient is considered to be critically ill, very unstable. Uh, patient care interventions are escalating. They're usually on um, many vasopressors or ionotropes, um, and those doses are increasing. The patient may be requiring neuromuscular blockade to be able to facilitate mechanical ventilation. This is a patient that's not able to tolerate any pediatric ICU stress at all. Uh, the goal SBS for this patient is less than one. Um, if no, neuromuscular blockade is being used, um, then we're not able to score the patient using the SBS and we use clinical judgment uh, assessing um, assume pain present or APP and assume agitation present or AAP. In any case, the goal of the acute phase is to maintain patient physiological stability. And we do that either using the same doses of comfort medication or escalate the dose of comfort medication. There's not any weaning done during the acute phase. Um, these are patients that are usually maintained on continuous opioid and benzoid infusions, um, not as, on as needed doses. Um, on the continuous infusions, if they're still experiencing an elevated SBS score, then we um, will rescue them or administer a bolus dose of uh, either the benzoid, benzodiazepin or the opioid medication. Um, if three or more rescue doses are required in an eight hour um, period of time or less than an eight hour period of time, then one or both of the continuous infusions are increased 10 to 20%. And all of this involves nursing clinical judgment. Once the patient is more stable, then they transition into the titration phase. Usually neuromuscular blockade is being discontinued. Um, the underlying problem is still active, but the patient is physiologically able to tolerate some of the stress of being in the cardiac ICU. The goal SBS scores at, uh, for this phase are about a negative one. In this phase, you have a patient that's receiving minimum yet effective doses of pain and sedation medications um, based on their SBS and their pain scores. What happens sometimes is that you have a patient that's in the acute phase and you're now, they're now physiologically a bit better and you're going to move them into the titration phase. However, they still have an SBS score of a negative two or negative three from the medications that they had received while they were in the acute phase. Um, when this happens, um, the patient needs to have a daily arousal assessment done or a modified daily arousal assessment. And a daily arousal assessment um, is when um, you stop the, all of the patient's pain and sedation medications until their SBS is scored at about a negative one. And then you restart those continuous infusions at 50% of their pre-arousal assessment dose. The modified uh, daily arousal assessment is um, decreasing the continuous medication infusions, the pain and sedation infusions, to 50% of the dose that being, was being used in the acute phase. And then again, rescuing the patient if they need to be rescued. What you're trying to do is maintain the patient at an SBS of about a negative one um, with their pain score less than a negative four. To be very honest, using a daily arousal assessment or a modified daily arousal assessment in the cardiac patient um, is really concerning because these patients don't always tolerate the change in hemodynamics that's associated with the patient being awake. Um, 
in these cases, when there's that much concern over how the patient is going to tolerate being awake, we will just adjust the patient's pain and sedation medications every eight hours based on if they've needed to be rescued in the previous um, eight hours before that. So every eight hours, we'll decrease either their morphine or their benzodiazepine continuous infusion by 10 or 20 percent. Which medication and how much is, again, based on nursing clinical judgment and team discussion. The last phase is weaning. And at this point, your goal SBS is zero because you want that patient to be awake and breathing and interacting with the environment. You also want to be able to extubate that patient and you want to get them off of their opioid and benzodiazepine continuous infusions. If the patient has received benzodiazepine infusions and opioid infusions for less than five days, you're usually able to just discontinue those infusions. In most cases, the risk of iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms occurring in these patients is very slight. Um, and, however, you're still going to want to have obtained a baseline Watt score on this patient and then do Watt scoring on a regular basis on these patients to assure that they're not experiencing any iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms. If the patient has received opioid and benzodiazepines for greater than five days, again, you obtain a baseline Watt1 score and you identify a target score for how, um, how much of the withdrawal symptoms that you feel this patient may be able to tolerate, if any. The morphine dose at that time is weaned by 10%, and then the patient is weaned every eight hours by that same dose, with the goal of the morphine or the uh, opioid infusion being off in three days. Once the opioid infusion is discontinued, the benzodiazepines infusion is weaned by 20%, and then wean that same amount every 24 hours with the goal of being off those medication, that medication infusion in about five days. The key here is only one medication should be weaned at a time. In this manner, if the patient is starting to experience withdrawal symptoms, you know what those symptoms are related to. At this point, uh, the midazolam and continuous infusions can be converted to scheduled lorazepam dosing. Um, in this way, sometimes better able to manage the patient um, as they're moving through the weaning phase. This is not considered a weaning step when you convert from IV to, uh, when you convert from midazolam to lorazepam. If a patient experiences an elevated um, what one score due to the, uh, the presence of iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms, that patient needs to be rescued using the medication that had been just weaned. What's important is that the wean not be stalled, that we continue to decrease the amount of medication that the patient is receiving, even if we have to go down to smaller doses of the, on the wean or longer increments that we continue the wean. We'd like to turn now and ask our audience a question. When you state your answer, could you please include your city and country location? The question is this, does your intensive care unit have a standardized approach to pain and sedation management. As we all know, symptoms of withdrawal on these patients are often hard to discern. How did you manage that? Some of the symptoms of iatrogenic withdrawal occur in other situations, and again, nursing clinical judgment is key in this. For example, loose stools is a symptom of iatrogenic withdrawal. However, an infant or small child may have loose stools if the concentration or volume of their feedings has been increased. It's up to the nurse at the bedside to be able to tease that out and to discern, is it iatrogenic withdrawal symptoms or is this patient responding to a change in feeding schedule or volume? The nurse at the, um, at the bedside that's caring for the patient um, we'll need to explain to the medical staff and the medical team that these symptoms are related to other conditions um, involved in the patient and that the patient wean needs to continue. Nursing clinical judgment is also key in differentiating between pain and sedation management. Um, there's an overlap in signs and symptoms of both of these and in the medications used for treatment. An example of this is um, a patient is going to experience pain in the first 24 to 48 hours after open heart surgery. We know this. 
Um, the patient has a sternotomy incision. There's a chest strain in, in place. And the patient receives pain medication for their um, symptoms and an elevated pain score. However, the same patient remains intubated. Having an endotracheal tube in place may be uncomfortable, or they may not just want that tube in their mouth or their nose. And the chest strain is removed, and, but the patient's now about a week out of surgery. They're showing the same symptoms um, that they showed 24 hours after surgery. Now, should they be treated for pain or for agitation? Um, these patients also experience sleep deprivation in the ICU. Acknowledging the input from the nurse at the bedside that's caring for the patient is, is key because that is, that's the person, that nurse at the bedside is the person that knows the patient really well. They know how the patient responds to different, um, different situations. And his or her input is really important in managing patient pain and sedation weaning um, and knowing what, um, what medications are better weaned um, and if the patient is experiencing pain or is it more the symptoms related to um, sedation or agitation. We'd like to turn now and ask our audience a question. When you state your answer, could you please include your city and country location? The question is this. Given the importance of nursing clinical judgment, do you believe nurses are supported in managing sedation and pain in your ICU? So what kinds of monitoring needs to happen to maintain Cardiac Restore? Well, first, we only initiated Cardiac Restore on the cardiac surgical patients. Uh, we've since expanded that to um, using Cardiac Restore on all the patients that are admitted to the cardiac ICU, both surgical and medical. We had daily walk rounds for about the first six to eight months after we started using Cardiac Restore. They checked in with each of the nurses that was caring for a cardiac surgery patient. Um, we talked with those nurses about what the patient's illness trajectory was. Um, was there a goal SBS ordered? Um, and was the patient's pain and sedation being managed with the Cardiac Restore algorithm? If it wasn't, what we did is we teased out what step the patient was deviating from the algorithm. Some of the information that was gained from the walk rounds also was regarding titration and the arousal assessments and how truly uncomfortable the staff were, both nursing and medicine, in doing those arousal assessments. To try to help staff become comfortable with this, we picked one patient that we would do a modified arousal assessment on. Uh, we had the medical staff stay very close by in case the patient became unstable and wasn't able to tolerate the arousal assessment. Um, and then we had a conversation with the nurse caring for the patient. So the nurse at the bedside knew ahead of time what, he, what she would do um, if the patient experienced an untoward effect with the arousal assessment. Because that type of an approach was so successful with the titration and the arousal assessment, I decided to use that type of an approach when I would talk with staff with doing um, the pain and sedation weaning. So what are your outcomes with using the Restore algorithm? Our latest analysis for post-cardiac restore involved the care of 381 patients. And we compared that information to pre-restore data involving 455 patients. Post-cardiac restore, we've shown um, decreased total mechanical ventilation hours and a decrease in hospital length of stay. Um, however, none of these numbers um, show statistical significance. What we have shown that's statistically significant is our reduction in the use of methadone, and this is very important in the care of our patients. We've also seen increasing overall nurse satisfaction with sedation management of patients. The outcome of reducing methadone exposure for these patients is so important, especially when we think about how challenging it is to discharge a patient home on methadone and the challenges that families face as they try to um, wean successfully on a newborn baby or a young child. So what are the next steps? Oh, we want to continue what we already have in place. We want to continue to educate staff on the comfort measures, um, making sure that staff understand how to score uh, patients um, using the pain and sedation scoring that has been validated and is in place. 
Um, we also want to make sure that staff is appropriately utilizing the WAT1 for iatrogenic withdrawal symptom scoring. Um, we also want to make sure that um, the patient is rescored um, if they have an elevated score and there's an intervention done for that score. We want to determine common um, algorithm deviations. In this way, we're able to focus education on the areas where there is problems and deviations and also make changes if there's something that's just not working for our patient population. We're going to continue to monitor um, ongoing um, sedation exposure levels. And this is going to demonst truly demonstrate the, ch the effectiveness of this change in practice. So how do you ensure your efforts are ongoing and that we have sustainability uh, of Cardiac Restore well into the future? We're going to, uh, we continue to use Cardiac Restore uh, on patient transfer to the cardiac inpatient unit, um, and we want to smooth that uh, transition. We're also working with the providers to improve access to the order sets that are used for Cardiac Restore. Uh, we just went live with new Cardiac Restore order sets, and this should make it easier for providers to initiate and to follow Cardiac Restore on the patients in the ICU. We want to analyze information from patient satisfaction questions, and these questions are now being included in our hospital discharge follow-up. Currently, myself or the nurse at the bedside is in conversation with the families regarding the pain and sedation management. The um, feedback regarding what we're doing with Cardiac Restore has been very positive, that the patients are having a better experience involving pain and sedation um, medication management with the use of Cardiac Restore. What do you envision two years from now? Um, we are planning to disseminate in publication about our experience using Cardiac Restore, and we're actively working on that um, project right now. Um, in two years, my hope is that our use of methadone will be so minimal that it won't even be stocked in our medication supplies on the unit. Um, I hope that Cardiac Restore will be the culture of how we care for our patients and that no reminders will be needed for that. Trish, I can't thank you enough again for coming to Open Pediatrics and sharing this important information with all of your colleagues across the world. The work that you have done to influence a culture and to improve care and sedation management for cardiac patients and their families is truly awesome. Thank you again. Thank you, Patty.